Dr. Ranella is going to talk to us about uh, MR and CTA. He's down at uh, so so he's a professor at uh, Irvine and uh, at uh, Chalk, director of the imaging section. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Child, Dr. Abelholson, and Kim, uh, Pam and the organizing committee. It's a distinct pleasure to be here. I am a pediatric cardiologist by training, as Dr. Child said. Uh, I spend most of my time at Chalk down in uh, Orange County. But I get to pretend I'm a radiologist when I'm up at UCLA, so it's a lot of fun. So anyway, um, we'll be discussing over the next 15 minutes or so uh, the um, <clears throat> sort of the, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, advantages and challenges of uh, cross-sectional imaging in MRI and CT. I have no disclosures, unfortunately, or conflicts of interest. Uh, everyone here knows the, the benefits of 2D echo, and we've seen uh, great presentations here by Jeanette about 2D echo, and uh, 3D echo pictures have been, have been shown, and uh, CT has been around for a while as far as the adult. Um, Population has used CT a lot, especially in the coronary artery imaging. And uh, MRI is a more recent, uh, newer kit on the block. And um, we'll be, uh, we've gotten to know some of the richness of information that can come from a well-performed MRI. So just briefly, it's been discussed uh, partially already, but I wanted to talk about the mainstay um, imaging just for a second, because ECHO still, rightfully so, remains the, uh, the uh, the workhorse, uh, and uh, there's, it's excellent for intracardiac anatomy for the diagnosis and classification of congenital heart disease in children and adults. Uh, for physiology, it's still quite excellent. Uh, for valve function especially, I think it's a great modality and remains uh, uh, superior, especially the use of Doppler echo. Uh, it's very reliable as far as the LV size and function quantification has been for some time. You get real-time imaging with high temporal and spatial resolution all in one package. It's portable, which has made it uh, quite useful, and uh, the equipment and the expertise and the, and the sonographers, which are well-trained in congenital heart disease, uh, are, are widely available. And it's relatively low cost if you're going to compare compare it to more advanced imaging like CMR and CTA. There are some important cons, however, particularly in this population. Limited field of view we're all aware of, particularly reduced acoustic windows in adults, especially after cardiac surgery. Uh, there's limited evaluation of the extracardiac vasculature, and that's a main um, pro to the cross-sectional imaging. And, there, and there's limited visualization of the RV, and for that reason, very limited uh, quantification as far as RV size and function. So then what is the role of CMR and CTA? Uh, when I say CMR, I mean cardiac MR in ACHD. Well, they're adjuncts to standard echocardiography. They're used to confirm echo findings and to address unanswered questions. They're uh, useful, especially in the setting of pre-cath and pre-op planning and post-op follow-up. Again, extracardiac vasculature is very well seen by these techniques. Tissue characterization, if we're talking about MRI, can be performed but with a, a focal and diffuse fibrosis imaging. Um, and um, the status of the lungs and liver can be at least screened uh, by these techniques. So in summary, uh, it's, th these, these techniques are ideal for complex congenital heart disease, as you can see the position of the cardiac chambers and the blood vessels relative to the body axis, and we'll talk about that in, in, um, in, some, in some detail. And also tomorrow's breakout sessions, too, we'll go more into that. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the differences between the two, cardiac MRI and CTA. So they're both 3D, um, they are both acquire 3D volume sets, typically of the entire chest. Uh, uh, MRI from any plane, and the CT is relegated to the axial plane, uh, but can then be reconstructed, as we'll see. Uh, no ionizing radiation, as has been mentioned in, in MRI, and I agree with Jeanette that that is an important point, whereas there's ionizing radiation um, <clears throat> with CT uh, and its real, uh, requisite potential cancer risk. Uh, MRIs take forever, though. They're, they are a long study, and the patients have to be able to comply. Um, <clears throat> we um, Part of my job as an MRI imager is to try to make the protocols efficient so that we can get a full study and have the patients comply. This is children and adults. It just, it just depends. Um, adults are claustrophobic. Children are not uh, old enough to follow instructions. So no matter what age, uh, it can be difficult. And there's breath holding involved. But most of the time, we're able to get patients through it. Um, in CT, uh, it's a much more rapid acquisition, particularly now with the triggered modes. These are uh, sub, sub second acquisitions and, uh, and we, we have them breath hold, but you really can't even breathe that fast. Uh, some, some fast, some 
how fast some of these scanners are. Uh, free breathing is, is possible with cardiac MRI. We do a fair amount here with our arrhythmia patients. Uh, there's, uh, as of now, no free breathing really with CT. We try to have at least a short breath hold. Uh, X, very good spatial resolution is obtainable by MRI. If you look at our angiography, we can get and routinely do, as Dr. Finn will show you in the next uh, presentation, submillimeter uh, resolution. But uh, CTA, the, the rule is submillimeter resolution, which is what makes the picture so amazing. Uh, MRI, you'll need gadolinium-based contrast or no contrast, uh, and in CT, you're um, you're going to need, uh, if you're going to do angiography, you're going to need uh, iodinated contrast with its requisite risks. Uh, there's robust uh, software for RV analysis available for cardiac MRI, whereas in CT, the RV analysis still remains challenging. Uh, flow analysis uh, is possible with MR and uh, not yet with CT. Metal causes significant artifacts in MRI, and there's less interference by metal uh, for CT. Uh, MRI is not ideal for coronary imaging. Um, again, Dr. Finn will show you a few nice pictures in the next, uh, I'm sure, in the next talk. But uh, CT is uh, currently the non-invasive gold standard. Contrast allergy, less likely uh, in MR, more likely in CT. Uh, there are a few well-trained technologists and, um, and personnel uh, for cardiac MRI to do dedicated cardiac MRI. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, th I think that to get a good study in a complex congenital patient, it is important to that a big center like, like ours here uh, does that study. Um, I feel strongly about that. And that uh, there are many well-trained technologists uh, for CT um, if you compare it to MRI. And then relatively few dedicated magnets and magnet time for cardiac MRI, uh, where there's an increasingly avail uh, availability of scanners for CT. So let's just do the pictures now. Um, Do Dr. Abelhosen mentioned an important point during his last talk uh, is the use of multiplanar reconstruction, or, or MPR. Uh, can't o o sort of overemphasize this. Uh, and it's, I, I would say, I would encourage everyone, and we're gonna go through some pictures here, to learn how to use NPR tools, uh, we, current, we use Osirix here, which is actually a um, uh, um, uh, shareware, uh, free online type software, uh, and uh, to, to use it to get as familiar with it as you do with echo systems. I mean, you know how to use an echo, you know how to measure echoes and manipulate them, and I would try to get as familiar with this type of NPR than you, as you are with echo, and I think it's gonna help a lot. Uh, and it's not that hard, actually, we'll show you tomorrow. But uh, this is a 40 MRA of a patient with truncus arteriosus, and what we usually do is we take the 3D volume MRA data set, and then the, the system will, will reconstruct it in three planes. So then you see, I guess the biggest laser pointer ever. Uh, so the axial plane, uh, the sagittal, and the coronal plane, all right? So we, we run up and down, we, we get a lay of the land there. Uh, and this is, a, this is me doing sort of a live demo. Uh, this is a CT angiogram of a patient with repair tetralogy of fallow and double valve replacement, aortic and pulmonary valves, and if I push the button, you'll see it. So here you'll uh, notice that we are, again, starting in the axial plane here. So I'm going to run in my reference view, which you can see here, the crosshairs. We'll also show you simultaneously the sagittal view. A lot of information, if you carefully do this, is, is obtainable. Heading up toward the aortic root, we're going to see uh, the corner. There's the replaced aortic valve, the, the prosthetic aortic valve. And now I'm sort of arranging it so we can see the left coronary artery. There's going to be a right coronary artery coming up there soon. There it is there. And this, this is particularly this type of technique, trying to get the different angles useful if you're going to do intervention on these valves and want to see how close the coronary arteries are, want to see how close the PAs are. Uh, if I make this window a little lighter, you can see the lungs really well, and we can evaluate the lungs. Then eventually here, um, we'll uh, triangulate and try to get to the, to the RVOT. So opening up the RVOT here, okay. Um, now this CT was optimized for the left side for the aortic area, but you can still see the, the right pretty well. Here's the RVOT now that we just opened up, then I can turn the blue plane and get it in short axis. So not to belabor the point, but that you can get multiple and save those images. The, our, our CATH colleagues can always use these uh, for their planning if they need. Um, this is some more examples of that reference view in a patient with uh, DTGA status post sending and pacemaker uh, starting in the axial plane. I've manipulated it into the pulmonary venous baffle, which you can see now in three planes. These are the pulmonary veins individually. This is the baffle here. You can see the systemic venous baffle above it. And then in short axis, you can kind of see the baffle there. So nice 3D view. And then move the axis to go into a systemic venous baffle, which is, you can see the contrast coming through here. There's also a pacemaker lead going through, as you can see there. 
Um, and then in short axis, you can see how small these things actually are in cross-section, and all the systemic flow from the upper extremity has to get through there. This is a great or uh, so then turning toward the great arteries to check those out. The coronaries are coming off. This is a TGA with a slightly more posteriorly oriented aorta than, you're ex than you expect. The aorta is usually a little more anterior. So again, um, good for that type of uh, fine detail. And then you can manipulate into your short axis with the typical systemic RV appearance uh, with the septum bowing from systemic uh, to pulmonary side. Um, then we can volume render these 3D images, and which sort of uh, makes a big volume out of them, paints them uh, special colors. And we can see, ex have exquisite pictures of the coronaries here. We can map them out, see if there's any stenosis, and at the same time, look at the positions of the great arteries. You can see how big these, uh, dilated these pulmonary arteries are in this patient. And this is, uh, this, this is a patient uh, that showed you earlier with uh, the trilogy of that is supposed to be aortic and pulmonary valve replacement. This is an MRI in the same patient. I just wanted to show you this, this to show you that actually these, these prosthetic valves have, are not causing that much metal artifact in these MRA uh, sequences. are a little more robust, and they're a little more resistant to metallic artifacts. So we got great pictures um, with, uh, with MRI. This is just a uh, technique that we can reconstruct the MRI in called a, a thin MIP which is a maximum intensity projection, so we can, you can ask your radiologist to, to create these. These really brighten up the arteries and um, make contiguous slices so that you can run it like a CT. Um, and so this is just the coronal plane, very, very nice pictures. And then, um, again, notice the um, other information, you know, liver, spleen, the other stuff that you can see. And... And then, of course, to, to round out the discussion, we can do the standard, what you expect from cardiac MRI is the um, short axis cines. These are cine sequences in the short axis plane. We use these to, oops, sorry. <clears throat> we use these to segment. And uh, you'll see as this rolls through the short axis stack, you'll see the different contours that we draw. I tell my children that I draw circles all day just like they do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so they're the circles that we're drawing, uh, systole, diastole, and then when you uh, get a stack of discs, we know how thick they are because we've prescribed that. We know the area that equals the volume, and then you can get uh, information on injection fraction, uh, volumes, cardiac index, mass for the LV and the RV. And as we all know, the MRI is the gold standard for uh, LV and RV quantification. So again, any plane you'd like, you can get CINE images. Uh, this is a patient with tetralogy of Fallot prior to and after uh, pulmonary valve replacement. So you can still see uh, quite well. I can see the RV looks smaller already. Uh, flow data can be obtained by cardiac MRI by a technique called phase contrast. And uh, this is an illustration of that. Um, and uh, so pulmonary valve here, we can put a region of interest around the pulmonary valve and get uh, flow, uh, flow maps. Uh, this is an in-plane flow of, an aort of aortic regurgitation. This is, echo pretend uh, this is MRI pretending it's echo and where you can see the jet uh, back and forth. This is an in-plane acquisition to get an idea of where the jet is, and we can take across the, the jet and across the area we want. Again, any angle we'd like. Um, and these are the maps that show that, uh, in the prior example, that uh, there's severe pulmonary regurgitation, so flow forward, flow backwards, and that's a lot of backward flow through the pulmonary valve. And so we can quantify that as a regurgitation fraction and a regurgitation volume. Uh, we can do time-resolved MRA, uh, where we follow the contrast bolus. This is obviously not, it's not a cath, but eh, it's not too bad. We, this is actually fairly useful, particularly when, uh, I find this useful in Fontan patients um, uh, to see if there's any qualitative difference in lung flow, if there's a unilateral um, pulmonary stenosis. This is a good way to get an idea, and we do this as a test bolus for the MRA anyway, so. So we get the information. Um, we've seen the contrast enhanced MRI geography already. And let's see, again, we can volume render MRAs um, as we can do CTAs as well and get some good um, high quality pictures. We use a lot of this in the in adult congenital population, but also in the neonatal population here at UCLA too. These are very helpful for. Uh, so just briefly to, to end the, the talk here, we're just gonna show just a few uh, sort of pitfalls. So metallic artifact as, um, as John showed you, uh, can really wreck an MRI, <laughs> ruins our day. Uh, so you can see that there's, uh, this patient has a pacemaker and you can, as, as this image comes back through, um, so not, I'm sorry, a pulmonary valve, which is causing uh, an stent, which is causing um, interference here. You can see how, how, uh, 
how grainy it is. Now, uh, in this patient, we can still, because the ventricles are still well seen, it could still get a, a volume and a, uh, and a function if we had to. So this is, uh, I wanted to also highlight with this picture that, again, discussion, this is a team sport, as has been said before, uh, the discussion with radiologists prior to the procedure, during and after, um, uh, regarding what, what, what's in place, what we expect, because uh, I'll have colleagues that say, well, I'm not getting an MRI because they have a stent. But in my opinion, I mean, we could, in this case, we could try it because we could still get them information, even though maybe that one of the PAs is not well seen. We could still get relevant information. So a good discussion prior with your radiology or team or your cardiac imager uh, is, is uh, vital. Uh, more metallic artifact with our standard CINE, but then we can do some things even on MRI to clean that up. These are uh, older style flash grade and echo type CINEs where we can actually see the, the valve here. Uh, and, and a stent right there as well, so a little bit better. Um, uh, pacemakers, uh, so pacemakers, you know, it was always taught that they're an absolute contraindication in MRI. Under certain circumstances, pacemakers and ICDs can be imaged under special circumstances under a, a strict protocol. Um, and um, there's, there's some on, if you go to mrisafety.com, they actually have a nice uh, summary there of when pacemakers and when leads are safe and when they're not safe. And actually, mrisafety.com has a lot of information like that as far as clips, coils, and any device that you want to ask about. But this is to show uh, the, the, the adverse effect of a pacemaker on the image. Can't really see anything in the same patient with a CT. Or there's the pacemaker. We were able to, to see something. So uh, again, good discussion with the radiologist prior. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Have a good day.